If you take the names, the first names of the people on the next panel, you can make an anagram sentence, but just barely. So Amy, Miranda, Robert, Eve, Haiting, and Brian becomes I hit a bear, avenge my arm, Brit, or Din. Please welcome Amy Davis Roth, Miranda Celeste Hale, Robert uh, Blaskowitz, Eve Siebert, Haiting Chin, and Brian Thompson. We got skepticism and the humanities. Hello, everybody. Oh, we didn't assign seats beforehand, and I was hoping there would be a fight, but apparently not. Uh, hi, I'm Brian Thompson. I am the outreach coordinator for the James Randi Educational Foundation, and this is a panel on skepticism and the humanities. And uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of things, so we'll get started pretty quickly. Um, just so you know, I, I woke up this morning feeling uh, completely upside down after the festivities of last night. So I'm wearing my Australian uh, skeptics, Victoria skeptics uh, t-shirt, uh, and actually now I feel right side up. <laughs> you. Do you, do you get it? This is, <laughs> this is the quality of jokes you're going to get this early in the morning. Thank you. I'm hearing mumbles of support from these people. Um, so let's, uh, let's just uh, go down the road and everybody can introduce themselves. Let's start with, with Amy. Hi everyone, I am Amy Davis Roth. A lot of you know me as Surly Amy. I write for skeptic.org. I, thanks, thanks for the five supporters out there. I have, a, <laughs> I'm also the managing editor for madartlab.com, which is a blog about the intersection between art, science, skepticism, and geek culture. And I'm the creator of Surly Ramix. Oh, oh, of course, yes. Um, I'm Miranda Last Hale. I am a... Oh, how do I do it? Is it closer? Huh. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'm Miranda Last Tale. I'm an English teacher. I teach uh, primarily rhetoric and composition courses um, at the community college level. And I tend to focus on applying those skills to um, skeptical activism. And I guess that's rel the relevant part. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eve Siebert. Uh, I'm also an English teacher. Uh, I have a PhD in English literature, specifically Old English, Middle English, Old Norse, and Shakespeare, because something fun and modern. Um, I blog at skepticalhumanities.com. Um, I'm interested in things like uh, creationist interpretations of Beowulf, um, which you'll be surprised to learn aren't wrong. And I'm, I'm actually wearing, this is a Grendel's skull. Amy might not have realized this, but. Yeah, I have no um, idea what I do, you guys. So. As it turns out, Grendel I need all was a dinosaur. Um, and yeah, anyway. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Bob Blaskowitz. Um, I'm a postdoc uh, in the Writing and Communication program at Georgia Tech for about two more weeks. Um, then I'll be going to uh, Wisconsin uh, where I'll take up a, a visiting <coughs> assistant professorship. Um, I'm also at Skeptical Humanities. Um, my PhD is in American Literature and Rhetoric and Composition. Um, my dissertation was on the uh, World War II veterans writings, um, both you know, memoir and, uh, and fiction. Um, and I teach a, a number of classes that take as their uh, subject extraordinary claims, um, giving students th the opportunity to uh, write about these topics and to research these topics on their own.
I am an opera singer by trade. That song had uh, lyrics by Surly Amy. You can buy them on a, on a not on a beer bottle, but on, on a necklace. I mean, I suppose if someone wants to buy this beer bottle. That's actually a good idea. Yeah, I might work we'll, that we'll, in. The, the, um, we will like uh, item now. donate the proceeds to the JRF. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, the, that music was written by uh, my partner in crime, Matthew Shickley, who is out there somewhere, last night at um, about 2 a.m. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, I, I am Hai Ting Chin, I am an opera singer, I podcast uh, with Matthew Shickley, the Scopes Monkey Choir, which is a podcast about <laughs> Scopes Monkey Choir, uh, which is a, about uh, it is the podcast where music and sound meet science and skepticism. And uh, I have an ongoing show that I'm calling Science Fair, which is science texts and writings by scientists set to music and staged with demonstrations. Excellent. And it was pretty embarrassing, too, because uh, just before this panel, uh, Hai Ting and I were talking about what she was going to do, and it turns out we were going to be singing the exact same song, so. It's awkward. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. <laughs> I just decided instead I would sing Poisons, Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Um, speaking of wonderful art, um, Let's just get some, let's get some definitions out of the way before we get started with the, with the, the meat of the panel. I, I don't know if everybody here even uh, knows exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about the humanities, to paraphrase Raymond Carver. Um, so, Bob, do you want to handle uh, just explaining to us what exactly we are talking about here when we say humanities? Well, when I think of the humanities, uh, the definition is, is, is a little fluid, um, as these things often are. Um, but it's a, a variety of, uh, of disciplines that have to do with, um, you know, communication and, and meaning, um, often, um, in, uh, in, including, you know, literature and languages and linguistics, philology, uh, cultural anthropology, depending on, on your definition of the social sciences, uh, the fine arts, uh, history, Theology uh, is a legitimate area of study. Um, uh, apologetics, but you know, theology is, is interdisciplinary. Um, and then there, there are area studies that are also incorporated uh, into the, under the umbrella name of the humanities, including things like uh, gender studies, um, uh, American studies, um, eco-criticism, um, communication studies, folklore, and classics. Um, and some people go so, so far as to include things like law uh, underneath uh, the umbrella of the humanities. So it's not just a bunch of people sitting around talking about just a bunch of nonsense. It's actually an <laughs> academic field it of is. study with expertise. Right, yeah, and, and that's one of the, one of the things that um, is, it, it, it can be kind of frustrating, I mean, uh, it, there seems to be a sort of divide, and, uh, and I, I know that Miranda will talk about this, but th there, there seems to be a sort of divide between uh, uh, at least a mutual misunderstanding about what the sciences are doing and, and what the humanities are doing. We don't really communicate as much as we really ought to um, because we share a lot of uh, similar goals um, and enthusiasms, really. Um, 
but do you want to talk about that, Miranda? Um, sure. Uh, this is, am I doing this right? Okay. <laughs> well, um, we had actually had this uh, discussion during our preparation time about how it is interesting that uh, the critical thinking skills are often taught in the humanities courses more than they are taught in science skill, you know, science courses. So um, we can often take that as a valuable thing from humanities uh, in the academic world, at least. And as Bob said, humanities has a very broad definition, which um, can be both a good thing and a bad thing right. because as you try to explain it, it is difficult to narrow it down. Yet, yeah, it is nice to have this sort of big umbrella because we can say uh, these things are valuable too, these things are worth studying, and they provide us with skills that we can apply to skepticism in a way that um, science does too, so it's, it's complementary but different. Um, I would say some parts of the humanities, some humanities courses are and, and subjects are a little more pragmatic than others. And uh, I tend to prefer that, especially when we're talking about the context of skepticism and how one can apply those skills and that subject matter to communicate effectively, to inform, and um, to a lesser extent, to persuade. It gets into the teaching how to think, not what to think, which is a cliche, but it's very important, mm -hmm. I think, especially in the humanities, perhaps. And um, so, I suppose I'm also here getting into the justification of why, because um, Bob and I had previously talked about, um, do we need to, it sounds weird, but defend, was that the word? Possibly defend the humanities. <laughs> defend yeah. the humanities, like their battle. Um, but yeah, it's a little bit of a justification, I suppose, for why these things are relevant to why we're here. And um, Are you going to call out Lawrence Krauss? No, I'll let you do that. You're better than that. Shit. Okay, yeah. Um, but I'm just saying, uh, I, I appreciate that you brought up that, or you or Eve brought up that thing during the pre, you know, during our preparation, that critical thinking skills are often. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, got it. Critical thinking skills are often uh, more prominent in humanities courses than in science courses. And that is, I suppose, ironic. But um, it isn't to denigrate the science courses by any means. I just believe they are complementary and both can provide with similar. No, skills. no, I think you've I think you've contributed to this turf war. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're gonna throw down. Yeah. Oh God, we're gonna lose so horribly because they've got rockets and stuff. Um, <laughs> we have words <laughs> and pictures and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we get we no can crap. paper cut you. Um, I can make the ceramics for on the rockets. So oh, we can right. work together, you guys. It's okay. Bridge building. Bridge building. Brian has rockets. Okay. okay. Fine. We'll, we'll work this out later. Look, a lot <laughs> of people do sign. think that there is this, this hard line divide between the right brain and the left brain. So I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about how you apply these, these critical thinking skills to critical what drinking, you guys do. Brian? What? Did, you just, did you just say critical drinking? Critical click? I'm sure <laughs> that you said critical drinking. How <laughs> late were you out last night, Brian? <laughs> We've I, all been drinking I, I critically. I will. Well, okay, well, first of all, I want to just sort of set the stage here because we do have this kind of, um, we have two people here who are, are artists and creators, and we've got uh, the rest of the panel is, uh, is more on the academic side and the study side, and the two aren't mutually exclusive, but I do want to talk about how you approach things from both the practical creation side of, of art and then how you approach critical thinking from the, the teaching and the study. Um, so. Amy, I think, how do you apply critical thinking to, to what you both do? Well, this is a topic that comes up a lot, especially with the blog that I write for, Mad Art Lab. Artists sort of have a reputation for being spacey, you know, hippie, pot smoking, lazy, <laughs> people that aren't really interested in the rational side of things. But when you really break down the creative process, it's very similar to the scientific method. Artists will take materials that they have available to them, sort of like the available data that you would have if you were in a scientific setting. You then come up with a hypothesis as to what you could perhaps make with that data or those materials. Then you do your experiments in your lab, which is your art studio, 
and you come up with something, maybe it's something wonderful, maybe it's something ugly, <laughs> you base it, you know, how, how does it compare to what I thought it was going to be, and then you release that out into the world, and it's up for peer review. So the rest <laughs> of you and other artists get to peer review our work. So I think that science and art are very, very similar in the process side of it. I like the word that you use, lab. I, I want to add, however, the corollary to this, this lyric that you wrote, science, you don't have to believe in it for it to be true. I would say that the art version is art. It don't have to be true for you to believe in it. <laughs> the, the part of the point of art is, is it's where we don't have to be rational and critical. In fact, it's great sometimes for us not to be, and even as skeptics, we can let ourselves go in that arena. We don't have to worry about whether it is true. We can keep that part of our mind going if we want or not, but in the art world, we can just, we can just feel, we can just experience, we can share it with our friends. It doesn't, it doesn't, we're released from the obligation for it to approach truth. And if it happens to approach some kind of Ugh. Emotional truth. Sorry, I don't know. Um, that's that's great for the artist and for the experiencer, but it's not necessary. And it's really also it's not also not necessary for art that the artist be critical or rational or anything. It's not necessary. It's possible. Yeah. Well, it's that's interesting because, I mean, art is subjective to a certain extent. But when you talk about bad art. Um, there's an example that I think everybody probably here can relate to, um, hotel room paintings. Can we all have the same ones here too? Probably, the it's just a bunch of horses. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but see how that's community building? We're all having similar experiences with that art. So even though it's bad art, all of us can take something out of that. It might be humor, it might yeah. be the fact that we all have that art. True. So it's, I think it's still well, has meaning. Well, I think that the, maybe, and, and I want to get your feedback on this because I'm probably wrong, but I think that, um, that maybe one of the primary criteria for, for bad art is a, a certain sense of, of untruth or dishonesty about it. Um, so, for example, with hotel room art, uh, you look at it and it's just kind of, it's competent, it gets the job done, although I don't know why my painting in my hotel room has a, a horse that appears to be lying down dead, except he has one head up. We all have that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. Um, but on the other hand, it, it seems to be done with sort of, the, sort of the cynical, bare minimum, like this was done not necessarily because of any sort of passion to, to relay any kind of, of truth that the artist was really feeling. It was done because these were the colors that were asked for in the hotel room. So. Do you think that there is, there is anything to that, 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 that the sort of the critical thinking, the science-minded people are in search of truth and art maybe is also in search of truth, or at least, at least the best kinds of art? Tell me I'm wrong. You're, You're wrong. wrong. <laughs> art, listen, art cannot show you, art cannot teach you truth. I, I, I have a, um, a director friend of mine who's fond of saying, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you already know what the message is, you can find it in the art and it can be reinforced by the art. If you are curious about some message that you don't understand, you also might be sort of tweaked into thinking about it by the art. But the point of art is not to instruct on facts or to search for deeper truths. That science, is, science is about trying to figure out how our human senses are fooling us and what is beyond what our human senses can, can perceive and, and how they are fooled. Art is about reveling in our human senses and the way they fool us and the beauty that comes out of the, the fooling us, the stories that our brains tell us, some of which are ridiculous and not true, but are really fun to think about. That's the domain of art. And again, I just want to reinforce, 
there's sort of this idea that the artist is dead. Once I create a piece of art, or anyone else creates a piece of art, or whoever the person is that created the ugly horse art that is in the <laughs> hotel rooms, whatever their intention was, and it could have been for that to be the most beautiful reference to their pony named Sugar that they <laughs> loved so much, whatever their intention is is sort of irrelevant once the art is placed in front of you. So it's up, up to you to decide what that meaning is. So, so Bob and Eve and Miranda, how do you apply critical thinking to the study of the humanities? But, but even more than that, how does critical thinking make you a better scholar in the humanities? Well, I, I think critical thinking is necessary to um, a any academic uh, form because, well, you just have bibble otherwise. Um, so uh, we look for evidence. Um, we uh, come to conclusions uh, based on evidence and we make an argument based on, uh, and, and then present the evidence to support our arguments. Um, it, it, in English literature or literature generally, you know, the text to a large extent is the primary source of uh, evidence, but also historical, contextual evidence, um, uh, and textual evidence for medievalists because, you know, manuscripts and stuff. Um, and if, in the humanities, there isn't like, you know, a one, one answer that's sort of correct uh, necessarily. Um, so you can have two different quite opposing uh, points of view about, say, Hamlet, because there are at least two different, uh, <laughs> as I understand it, uh, points of view about Hamlet. Um, but, but, they can, but it's still valid, as long as you are presenting evidence that's valid. Uh, I remember the first time I <laughs> taught liter a literature class, and I had told my students, you know, because the papers, they don't really like writing them, it turns out. <laughs> Um, no way. And I said, uh, well, you know, there's no right answer. Um, and then I started grading the papers, and then I, I, I revised that to, there are wrong answers. <laughs> um, there, I mean, there is no single right answer, but there can definitely be wrong answers if you're saying something that's directly contradicted uh, by the evidence. Um, then that's probably not so much correct. Um, or if you're just apparently have made up your own story. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> I've had that students go, well, maybe uh, Rip Van Winkle's wife, with the <laughs> it's like, well, maybe, <laughs> but that's just a different story. Um, and it's great, and go ahead and write that story, but not for this uh, paper that's an analysis of the, the story. You know, there's a, a, another thing that, that I realized early on in, in teaching writing classes. Um, uh, I had a, a, a student, this was like, you know, it was my first day as a graduate student teaching a, um, a, a, a college level class and I was all fun, and I was wearing a suit and everything, and, you know, all respectable. I, you know, I, I ditched the backpack for the computer bag. And, and long I, pants and everything. Long pants, yeah. Um, <laughs> And, uh, that propeller beanie. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I showed up in full academic regalia, and it was the damnedest thing. Um, no, um, but I had uh, a student who kind of, after I read the syllabus, I was clutching it really tight uh, and, and trying to power through it. And at, at the end of that, uh, he said, um, oh, I thought this was going to be a creative writing class. Um, where it's a research class, and I, I stopped for a second. I like, but but all writing is is creative, you know. Um, that, that that there isn't uh, the, the analytical side and the creative side are, are joined perfectly in in, uh, uh, in these writing classes. Um, so yeah. Well, I, I we had a friend who at some point got frustrated with her dissertation and had decided she was going to write a dissertation haiku. I, I believe the committee didn't really go for that, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes me sad. A dissertation tweet. <laughs> <laughs> but how long would a haiku have to be to be a dissertation? Mm -hmm. 
Why Hamlet you was mad. Like that was her, her plan. Oh, yeah. I think you meant just... Hashtag really Camp 2012. Well, the dissertation was only three lines long, but there was a 500-page bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> footnotes. But, yeah, footnotes. footnotes. Mostly footnotes. Yeah. Well, the... Um, <laughs> can I do just a little bit on this question? Sure. Still? Yeah. Okay. Um, I like that we discussed the pe pedagogical aspects of how critical thinking affects the humanities and um, has a relationship to it. I think that those pedagogical skills, teaching skills, uh, are completely transferable outside of the classroom too. And that's what makes it relevant to what we're talking about here. Because we get to get out of the academic world and which can be very boring on occasion and um, insular. And we get to take it out and use those skills that we have in perhaps a more practical manner where we're not just assigning papers and um, about Hamlet or haiku. And instead we are using the skills that we teach about how to f find sources, evaluate their quality, uh, use them to support your arguments. That's often a thing with students. They do not want to support their arguments with evidence. They just want to say, I believe it. Therefore, it is true. And that isn't how it works. And so that can be a very hard thing to overcome. So once we can sort of uh, help students in the classroom to learn that they do need to support their actual assertions with good quality evidence, I think that's very relevant what, to skepticism. Good evidence? Well, they don't like that part either. Well, what do you mean by good, though? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, here's my opinion. And look, the Google agrees with me. Or Wikipedia, which I love. but. I, I always have to explain that mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily the most trustworthy source. But anyway, I just mean that um, we, we can transfer those skills to skepticism in the sense that we can communicate uh, how it, important it is to support our assertions with evidence outside of just writing papers, but whatever, well, whoever our audience is and whatever our goal and objectives are. So, go ahead. And I think uh, communication is, is one of the primary goals of anybody who's a good skeptic. Yes. I mean, the, what, what it means to be a skeptic, at least in, in the, the way that we are here, we've, we've come to a gathering of fellow skeptics. We're not just sitting at home, just thinking to ourselves, you know what, I think evolution is true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are interested in communicating that idea. Being and, active. And, and helping people who are being harmed by false beliefs. Yeah. And, and so that's the one thing that every, you know, even though that we have practicing artists and their severest critics together on the, on the same panel. The, the one thing that... Uh, <laughs> Bob, don't sorry, start what? a war. The, the, uh, 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 I don't know. I heard him saying, that song sucked. I, I'm, I'm not trying to cause any tr trouble or anything. I feel like he was there's going to be a war today. She's the only no, one with a glass bottle. It didn't suck, it blew. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mess with her, Bob. Uh, the, that's the one thing that we all have in common is that we're all communicators, um, and uh, that's one of the uh, uh, fundamental uh, principles behind the humanities uh, is that we are trying to put our uh, understand one another better, um, understand like the cultural products uh, and artifacts that people have produced. Um, we put ourselves inside someone else's head when we're reading a novel. Uh, we try to understand uh, what was daily life like uh, during the, the, the Renaissance. It, 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 you know, kind of to go back to what Michael Sherman was saying on the first day, uh, these are ways of practicing expanding our sympathy for our fellow humans um, and to celebrate um, what we're capable of doing. Um, and, and that's very important. And I want to bring it home a little bit, this <laughs> message of what visual art, what performance art, what the humanities in general, how we as this community use it. Just a few examples that come, come to my head. Phil Plate, we're all pretty much familiar with him. I don't know if you follow him on Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus, but he is absolutely amazing at what I think is an accident that he does. He <laughs> posts these gorgeous photos of the cosmos and it draws you into his conversation. Suddenly, you can understand what he's talking about when he's discussing black holes or other phenomenon. Uh, Scott Sigler, you may be familiar with him. He's a best-selling <laughs> horror author. But what he does with his characters is he 
He has skeptical characters that use real science in his books. That helps to communicate that. Uh, Tim Minchin, his, his, yeah, hello, right? What about his beat poem? I mean, that probably taught more people about, you know, the, the problems with alternative medicine than, than any argument that I've heard. Um, our beloved George Robb knows, yeah, he knows how well he can get a jingle to stick in your head so you'll remember a bit of science. I think that there's a lot of ways that we can practically apply, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sort of wishy-washy ideas of performance and visual art to express, you know, what we're trying to tell a larger audience about critical thinking. And it, uh, we were talking earlier about the idea that art is often a way of recognizing your tribe. Mm -hmm. yeah. That you, you hear the music, you right. sing it together, you, um, you see the, the jewelry or the clothes, you uh, make a reference to a movie, and in our modern world where we're choosing our tribes, uh, <laughs> we have many, but it, it's a, a way of bringing ourselves together, recognizing each other, a shorthand for all kinds of things that we know we have in common, and a way of reinforcing that and making us feel a certain kind of common humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's really important that people, when you recognize some art or artist that you like, that you support that person, not just with enjoying their art, but this is weird, but financially, because a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you buy the CD, go to the show, um, a lot of art has been commissioned and paid for by people that we do not agree with Catholic over the church. millennia. The church, for instance. <laughs> I spend a lot of time singing for the Episcopal Church because they have an institution, they have a repertoire, they have money to pay me. I talked to a, a really nice a visual artist last night who makes inspirational Christian art because people buy it. So if you want art that supports your worldview, go out and support it the way you, the way, to show that you want that worldview represented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. By Surly Amy's. Or the pony guy that made the paintings in the hotel room. Yes. And the pony guy, we should support yeah. him. I mean, he really loved sugar and, you know, that horse had a good life. I think he's sold enough paintings. Yeah, I yeah, think he was probably supported by this hotel. He's no, really just rich. Like, a, like a crowbar and, a, and like an uh, eyeglasses screwdriver, you can get those right off. Brian, did you, did you make those paintings? I did. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I just want to say really quickly that, the, you know, scientific-minded and skeptical-minded artists are rather rare. But I know for a fact that there's at least five people out in this audience right now that are skeptical-minded artists. Uh, yeah. I would raise that to I'm hoping 20. there's more. There's six now. There's, <laughs> there's a gentleman in the front. He's great. But yeah, it, we need to show that, that we appreciate this art and that we're trying to build a community. And that will then build a bigger community. So support even the artists that haven't made anything yet. And tell them to put their stuff out there, because we need you guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah especially. Uh, in this era of the internet where it's so easy to spread the word about something. A lot of people, I think, um, mistake spreading the word for support. And uh, it's great when you, when you can like a Facebook page or tweet <laughs> about, you know, you should go check this thing out, but uh, you're actually contributing. Hit, you, hit a donate button if yeah. there's one there. Buy a CD, buy a, ask if, if you can buy a painting or a sketch. <laughs> It sounds, this sounds so mercenary, but when I think about, <laughs> but when I think, I'm, when I think about all the money that's being given to artists to make art for, uh, to support a worldview, to reinforce, to legitimize worldviews that they don't believe in, it, it makes me mad because somehow, I, I'll leave this to the experts, for some reason art is powerful, it touches us, it moves us, and we would love to use it to move us in the right direction, to move humanity mm -hmm. in the right direction instead of some of the ones that it has moved in for the last well, do you think 6,000 years. Do you think that there is a quality trap, though? And what I mean by that is um, I was raised Southern Baptist, and when you, go to, when you go to church a lot, you see a lot of uh, movies made by the church. You see a lot of puppet shows for some reason were really big in the Southern <laughs> Baptist circuit. Um, 
<laughs> you see all these things and, and, and everybody watches them and everybody says that they like them, but if you judge them based on sort of the, the, the prevailing standards of that form of art, you know, if you're an academic, then you understand that, that there, are certain, there are certain objective criteria you can judge a subjective thing like art by. So, for example, um, I don't know if anybody else has seen the, the Kirk Cameron film, Fireproof, <laughs> yes. which is about a, how a, a guy uses Jesus to help him not be a jerk to his wife. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to get into it. That's some Look, good art. The point is that it's, it's just, not only is it, is it not a good movie in its messaging, it's poorly made. It's uh, as from objective standards, like the lighting is bad, the editing is bad, but people, the people who that movie is made for love it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is, there is a risk in the, the critical thinking in the science community of us falling into that same trap where I'm, we will spread something because we agree with the message, but it's not necessarily something that's of the quality to appeal to outsiders? Listen, there's a lot of bad art yeah. in the world. Yeah. There is inevitably a lot of bad art about all kinds of things and about nothing at all. But the, the more art, that get, there's so much... There's so much bad, say, there's so much bad music that was written during Bach's time. But what do we remember? We remember Bach. And we only got Bach because there were so a thousand and one <laughs> horrible composers right. writing for the Lutheran Church. And <laughs> what I'm saying is su support everything. If you, yeah. if you like it, especially, consume it, support it, spread it around, pay for it. Uh, if, you, if you don't like it, you know, it's there. And it, it's part of the morass. It's part of the... There are, seven billion people on the planet. There's people like all kinds of art. Some people like those horse paintings on the wall. There's art for everybody. <laughs> the more art there is about something, the more chance we have that there will be good art about it. Yeah, I was on a panel last week at Convergence at Skepticon, or Skepticon, sorry, and uh, one of the panelists named Ryan brought up a really good point that when he first started making art, he made really ugly art. And he just started putting it out there and he found other people that made really ugly art. And they got together and they became friends and they encouraged each other. And then as time went on, they made beautiful art. So I still think that it's important that we encourage people, especially in such a small community that we have, we need to be supportive of the arts and we need to encourage people, you know what, make ugly art, write a bad song, go out there, do it, keep doing it. Same with podcasts, it's like anything. The first few things you're gonna come out with, they might not be fantastic, but if you have good intentions and a good message that you're trying to share, you should keep at it. You know? But this is also why I say, if you like it, support it. Because right. that's you know putting your support behind, hopefully, raising up the better stuff. Yeah, you don't have to buy the ugly art, but just say, good job. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep at that, you know, keep it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's sometimes, good. Sometimes, I mean, I like what you said about there being lots of wrong answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there, you can say, sometimes you're allowed to say, that's horrible, I don't like it. That has my, nothing to do with science There should be a Facebook button this that's kind just of like condescending thinking. compliment. I love my, that. Yeah. should be a maybe <laughs> condescending compliment. You, once, once you really my, made something there. <laughs> one, of, one of my students asked me what BARF meant in the margin of their paper, and it said I, I threw up a little when I read this. And, yeah. Do you actually write that in your papers? Barf? You yeah, I, I have. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I actually barf on it. <laughs> <laughs> just occasionally. Yeah. Right, that um. Well, no matter what we do, whether you're an artist or a scientist or a construction worker, um, if you're here, you're interested in, in getting to the bottom of reality, promoting a reality-based viewpoint of the world and, and, and learning as much as we can about what's really going on in the natural world. So um, let's just start with Miranda, but anybody okay. can jump in later. Um, what do the humanities teach us about reality that a traditional science education does not? Um, well, uh, I don't know if uh, we're necessarily all on the same page about this, but probably pretty similar. Uh, I don't honestly think that the humanities do teach us anything that science doesn't, but it gives us the skills that can help us to think about things that have been discovered empirically and rationally and with evidence and that have gone through testing, um, and we can say something like peer review, and Amy has used that very broadly, which is, which is good. 
Um, we can peer review anything, basically. Um, it goes back to the two cultures uh, by C.P. Snow from the late 50s, which probably just stirred up more controversy than anything else with the division mm -hmm. of humanities and science. But um, honestly, I don't think that science or that humanities can necessarily teach us anything that isn't already out there, but we can use our tools to help people to discuss it and to uh, spread the messages, not just science messages, but whatever it is that is already, um, but I'm using a very broad definition of science here too, obviously. My, we, I don't know what would the word be for what I'm talking about, I guess, um, rush or empiricism, perhaps? No. Uh, one of the things uh, that the humanities can teach us about reality that science can't uh, would be how to parse up this particular question. Um, that, uh, you know, it, there seems to be an assumption behind the question that like, the, the highest achievement that man can uh, reach is to somehow grasp reality. And that's not exactly what the humanities are about. Um, that they're uh, uh, about represent, maybe representing reality. Yeah. Um, uh, at, I, although I do think that there are things, uh, like uh, Amy pointed out, that, that, that science and, and, and art and the humanities do share. Uh, I think we have pretty much the same delight when we go into an archive and we find a document that totally changes our view of something. It's rare, um, but uh, it happens. And we, we like, like scientists, we like to peek around the corner a little <laughs> bit. Um, we like to, to speculate. Um, and then go out and see if we can find something that uh, confirms it I, I, or deny, uh, you know, challenges uh, those speculations. Um, I, I think that there is, there, there's a lot of commonality there. So you're going through a similar process of science that scientists do. Yeah. Um, the when, when it's done well, when it's done well. Yeah, and Amy talked about that too, even with making art. Is you're going through that similar sort of process that scientists do. I I'm gonna jump in and say that I, I'm, I'm a little confused by the question, Do, can, can the humanities teach us something that science cannot? Um, well, I wish I had a neuroscientist up here because I'm sure that there's research that's been done in terms of emotions and how it affects the brain. So uh, I, I would think that there would be science in how humans react when they see things. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's a lot to be said for uh, communication using art and that a lot of us who are lay people myself included, that don't really understand the hard science and might be scared away from the, you know, the, the specific studies and the arguments that are you know, very highbrow. I think that art can allow the rest of us to engage in the scientific discussion. So perhaps I think of it more as a tool than as something that's specifically separate from I science. think that's a good, and, yeah. Pragmatic. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think as far as you know, physical reality, well, you know, studying that, we're gonna let you do that. Yeah. Um, uh, no one was ever writing a poem and then accidentally, oh look, I split an <laughs> atom. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I don't know, just, Feynman may have been infinitive. playing the bongos when he figured out some physics that's there. True. I'm not yeah. sure if that's entirely true. Could have happened. Causation, or um, correlation, not causation. <laughs> so, I, we uh, so rea it would be have to be reality in a sort of in broader terms, mm -hmm. and the experience of reality is as people have been experiencing reality mm -hmm. for years. Uh, I think more than ten now. Um, people <laughs> experiencing reality. I'm not sure. Yeah, for are at least a, six thousand. Are you a really young That's earth right. creationist? Like you're a ten year creationist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go make any really bold claims, but. Um, <laughs> And so, obviously, history uh, looks into things like that, and, and arts, the way it's been expressed, the way people have experienced reality, what they thought was important, what they thought was interesting. Um, uh, and so, I, that's a valid way of, I think, looking at the world, too. Uh, and in fact, uh, Amy, you're saying that you wanted a, like a, a neuroscientist up here, and there's actually. I just uh, like them. Do we have any just neuroscientists? Kinda, are cool. Hang out with them. Probably with, with some fun equipment. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, but there, are, there. I mean, there, there. Are, the sciences do seem to be kind of uh, 
influencing what can be done in the humanities, uh, there's an entire field of study known as uh, neurophilosophy. Um, now that we have uh, uh, a better understanding of, of say, mere neurons, you know, um, what does that have to say about human creativity? What does that have to say about the old Greek uh, principle of mimesis, of imitation? I mean, just that, it changes things. Um, and if you're doing something, I, I mean, I'm not sure that uh, good work in the humanities will ever overturn science. I, but then again, I don't think it's trying to. Um, th there, there, there's, there are some people who did try to do that. The, and the French uh, in the 60s. The, you know, yeah, the, you know, the postmodernists okay. or you know, like a radical feminist view of, of science as uh, raping nature. When we talk about, we can just talk about postmodernism in, in general. I mean, we don't have to, but just how that can. Uh, can we just put neuro in front of it and have neuro, it neuro, neuro postmodernism? postmodernism. <laughs> um, when we talk about, I'm not talking um, about it anymore. the so the Sokol affair, and how um, yeah. easy it is for uh, frequently uh, postmodernists, and it's still around, unfortunately. It never seems to yeah. go away. Um, they will adopt the terminology of science without knowing, or they probably know what it means, but in order to further their argument, even though it's pure nonsense, well, and that's the, how there's, the social affairs. There's a, a lot of posturing in postmodernism. Um, you think? And yeah, <laughs> and and um, uh, yeah, they appropriate science words uh, in order to, to to assume the authority of science. I mean, it's a rhetorical move. Yeah. Um, uh, but when pressed. They, they can't explain what they're talking about, um, and I, 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 I find that very frustrating. Uh, I think that part of the bad rep that the humanities have gotten in, you know, in science circles has to do with the fact that there is this small number of fringe cultural theorists oh, yeah. who are willing to appropriate the language of science and just expound mindlessly on it. And Aren't they dead now, though? Huh? Aren't they all dead? No, I mean, it, still it still gets They're, taught it's in... like zombie Are there like theory. Derrida zombies? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, they come out and, and they want your brains, but in a really irritating way. In a really... <laughs> <laughs> in a really... Talking and talking. In a neuropretentious way? Yeah, and then you just want to take it out yourself and just throw it at them. Sorry. Um, can, can I'm I, trying uh, to stop this war. Can I, can I uh, <laughs> deflect us from yeah. postmodernism for Please a second? Please do. And say that um, I think a lot of the humanities and, and the arts are about sort of holding up a mirror to ourselves and drawing our attention, is holding up a mirror to us as a sort of collective and drawing our attention to, to something um, in the way, and, and by doing that, they, oh, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, we, we, I mean, we know that we, we know that that um, we can only pay attention as as human beings. We can we can only pay attention to so much at once. And yeah. I think there's a, a collective way of doing this too. The humanities can draw our attention to a certain thing that we might find is important for some reason. It can show. It can suggest a question that science might ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think that also. Um, some of the literature nerds in the audience, I think, would, would understand this. But I think I can explain it in a way that, that is pretty easy to understand. There's a, big, there's a difference between the cultural philosophy kind of postmodernism and the literary kind of yeah. postmodernism. Yeah. And in literary postmodernism, it yeah, is... We don't have to... It we is, can stop well, talking I think, about this. I think it speaks to what you're saying, I think, because it's, 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 it's kind of a scientific process. So, for example, in... Um, oh, you want to define... That's the problem. Yeah, yeah postmodernism is, is defined as that which cannot be defined. Yeah. That's actually deconstruction. There you go. Yeah. Blame, blame Brian for continuing this discussion, please, yeah. because we don't want to talk about postmodernism. Well, okay. Isn't it, it's also kind of the, the anti-modernism knocking down the idea that there yes. is progression towards something greater. Right. And sure. There's an idea that there's... In cultural theory, there, there's this, this idea that the meaning of a, of a word or some type of cultural symbol is not really contained within it, but it is defined by a series of negations. What is and that? therefore, you can make... It means nothing. 
I know. It, it, it's 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 it, all Me meaning is ex, it's extrinsic. The intrinsic meaning is extrinsic. And what does just, that even mean? And, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, all all language <laughs> deconstructs into meaninglessness. And if you, as if, I believe really we've depressing. proven here today. Thank you. <laughs> yes. That makes me want to be an artist. But you can pull back from that and talk about uh, talk about context, uh, like general semantics, um, which is the idea that it's a mistake in communication to assume that the map equals the territory. In other words, a map is not the yeah. land that it represents. It's a representation of that land. A word is not the idea it represents. Right. It's a symbol for that idea. And this is very important, I think, for anybody who's interested in communication to not assume that everybody has the same ideas attached to the same symbols. That relates to art very well. Yeah, that's, and that's sort of what I was trying to get at when I said that art cannot tell you truth. If you, if you have, if you believe, if you think that you know a certain truth, you're gonna see that in the art. Um, so, and, and the art cannot, in, in, the art cannot directly instruct you about a different truth that might suggest to you some other. There's and that sort of comes back to the idea of art being a sort of mirror that can draw your attention in one direction or another, and then science can study in that direction to search out whether we're right about it. But it's not art is not there to. You show think there's you a the truth or tell do you can inspire you to think confirmation bias in art sometimes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you, definitely. Have you seen there, that in but your, it, your practice? But, but, there's but a, you're allowed to. I mean, do you think I it's mean, always a good thing, or always a bad thing? Or, oh, but that goes back to the tribal issue, too. You know, it can I think be a good the, community building thing. Yeah. One of the problems that, um, at least in you know, like my, my graduate training, was that we didn't draw attention to the fact that there was something called confirmation bias. In fact, in all of the, the you know, one of the things Eve and I are working on is a, is a writing textbook. And I, you know, I looked through the Modern Language Association database for the phrase confirmation bias, and it appeared <laughs> once luck. in the entire database. Uh, people, it's just not on the radar. And one of the, you know, when we're training someone to do an interpretation of a novel, often you're finding someone just picking out, out of Moby Dick, five or six passages and saying, this is, this is my case. And you, you need to, that's discarding a lot of data, right? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> that can be valid if you're not right. then saying, and therefore the whole novel means this. But I mean, you can pick out a, a small part of Con conclusion and, and discuss that part of base cherry picking. You know? Well, well, we can we can all continue this discussion yeah. outside. Yeah. We're out of time. Uh, we we really? did not come to um, physical violence, which was good. Um, well, not yet. If anybody's interested, though, I guess maybe like downstairs, like outside the conference area, please, if you're going to come to Blows. Can I say so. one thing really fast? Oh, yes, one thing I, really You know, I just, it, I, in clo closing, I just want to encourage anyone out there in the audience that has a skill that they can lend to the fight, uh, you know, of skepticism to get out there and, and do it, that if skepticism mm -hmm. is really going to be a valuable tool that will encourage the progress of humankind, then this community is going to have to find ways to speak to our emotions as well as our Absolutely. intellects. Okay, guys? Mm -hmm. To be and active, I, no matter how. Do stuff. <laughs> one last and, and I would like, uh, if, if, if somebody here is an educator who is using uh, extraordinary topics in their classes in the sciences or in the arts, um, I'm currently working on the, the SWIFT blog uh, to assemble work uh, that you're doing in blog format. So if you could kind of find me or look up my email or look at my website or whatever. Yeah, we're looking for that for uh, randy.org. So uh, absolutely. Find Bob will be outside having a fight after this. Yes. So just find him. And All right, well, I, thanks. I, I, thanks and I think, I think oh, we, will, um, we will sell this bottle and it's accompanying Is there alcohol in it? Yeah, instrument. we'll donate the money back no to the There is no beer jailer. left in this bottle um, at Amy's table and we'll, we'll donate, donate the, the money yeah. to the JREP. So if you're interested, yeah. come back. Awesome. Yeah, thanks to Amy, Heiting, Miranda, Eve, and Bob. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so